Yes. Today, I would like to discuss with you how we can decipher complexity in biology. And I'm going to present perhaps the most complicated problem we have, which is the induction of embryonic cell differentiation by morphogen gradients. And this, I hope, will help us understand how new knowledge is acquired in biology. And in embryology, we have always had a vocation to study the embryo in a holistic way. Most of the talk will be the description of a biochemical pathway that controls dorsoventral cell differentiation. And at the end, I'll present some new results showing that there is a morphogen gradient that patterns both the ectoderm and the endomesoderm at the same time. Now, in biology, we cannot deduce general laws because uh, species have evolved through natural selections. So to go from a sponge to a human, you, know, you have had to pass through so many thousands of steps that you would not expect to be common to all animals. So what, of course, we do have a common genetic code, fortunately, and so that helps. But even if you have a complete genome, you don't know how that genome is turned into a phenotype because that occurs during embryonic development. So what we do is to make like a mental image of how it might work, how, how a mechanism might work, and then we design experiments to test them to see if they're true or not. That's the method of most uh, natural sciences. Now, the description of such a method that I found as the most interesting one was in 1865 uh, 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 by Claude Bernard, who essentially is the epistemology of, of, uh, of biology. So he said that the experimental idea is the result of a sort of presentiment of the mind, which thinks things happen in a certain way. In this connection, we may say, we have in our minds an intuition or feeling as to the laws of nature, but do not know their form. We can only learn from experiment. And most of his book is about say that we must always only decide through experiment and not through any other thing. So the scientist notes a fact, usually from previous work, and then you know, using his reason, he tries to design an experiment and then test it, and that leaves you to another system, uh, to another question, and so on. And uh, the story I would like to tell you today is exactly out of this very old book, I think. And it will start uh, in 1901 with Hans Spemann, who started pulling embryos together with a very thin thread, and he got, in some cases, uh, uh, twinned embryos, perfectly good twins. Now we know that if we uh, take an embryo and cut it in half, uh, uh, you can get, depending on how you cut it, different results. This is a frog embryo from the frog Senopus that at the 8,000 cell stage has a region of less pigmentation and one of more pigmentation. The one of less pigmentation will give rise to the dorsal part of the animal. The more pigmented one will give rise to the belly or, vent or, or, or ventral part of the animal. The dorsal half will rescale and form a fairly good embryo. But the ventral half, which lacks something, then only forms ventral mesoderm and forms no central nervous system, has no muscles or anything. But if you take care to divide this embryo from the dorsal to the ventral so that both parts are, you can then get the Siamese twin. So this is like an ultimate form of regeneration in which you know, you're regenerating the missing half of the embryo. And this occurs also in other animals, such as crickets in this case. So you would think that you would never learn anything out of something so complicated as this, but the simplifying experiment was done by Hans Spemann in 1924 with his student Hilde Mangold, in which they transplanted a little region of the embryo from an unpigmented embryo into a host. They took this region here, that's the blastopore lip where the mesoderm involutes. And when they did that, they found that, that the em embryo, which is normally a single embryo, now formed a Siamese twin. And so, Spiemann was influenced by physics, and so from electromagnetism, 
he thought, well, there is a field in the embryo, and when we do this transplant, we divide the one field into two fields. And since they, and so there must be a long distance interaction, and in fact, they had it, it marked this so that they had an unpigmented graft, and so the unpigmented bit of embryo gave rise to the notochord and a little bit of this structure called the somite, which is a muscle block. On the other side, the entire somite was derived from the host, as is the entire central nervous system. So this showed that there is an induction that cells can induce other cells to adopt new differentiation patterns, and that this can take place after long distances. Now, this experiment was very important at its time, and uh, uh, for this, uh, Speyman got the Nobel Prize in 1935. But we had to wait 60 years before we could get the molecules that caused this induction because we didn't have the recombinant DNA technology that we now have. But this wasn't completely lost uh, because in 1952, a mathematician by the name of Alan Turing and Gerhard Ertl uh, talked about this already, made this enormous simplification. He said, well, thinking about biology, Maybe we could propose that in tissues there might be these molecule substances that I will call morphogens. They might be coming out from regions like this organizer region of Speyman, and then such molecules, if they're diffusing, they will obey the laws of physics and chemistry so that you know, the variation of the concentration of the morphogen, which is C over time, will depend on the diffusion laws, which depends on the diffusion constant, and and the second derivative in space of the concentration of the morphogen, plus the different reactions that this morphogen will have, such as synthesis, degradation, and association with other proteins. So this was an amazing simplifying influence, I think. And, uh, uh, and he realized that the, the, these two molecules had to react with each other to create patterns. Now, 20 years later, uh, Hans Meinhardt realized that a pair of morphogens so you, of these reaction diffusion equations consisting of an activator and an inhibitor that react with each other will generate stable pattern provided first that they ori originate from the same cells and second that the inhibitor is more diffusible than the ac activator. So you see both are produced in the, in, by the same cells, for example here the activator diffuses less, but since the inhibitor diffuses more, it will predominate in the periphery and therefore inhibit the activator, giving you a stable pattern. Now, the amazing thing is that these purely theoretical predictions actually prefigured what we was actually then found, that there are these pairs of activators and inhibitors that react with each other and actually pattern the embryo. And we now know that the embryo does have a, a gradient in it, and this gradient I'm showing is of a protein called phosphorylated SMAD1, and you see that there is more phosphorylated SMAD1 in the nuclei of the ventral side of the embryo than on the dorsal side of the embryo. This phosphorylation reflects a gradient of a growth factor called bone morphogenetic proteins, which are proteins that were extracted for bone and when transplanted into, uh, under the skin of a rat will induce bone. But it turns out that these molecules are very important in the embryo too, and they are in fact part of, um, of a family of, um, of uh, proteins called uh, TGF beta superfamily. There are about 30 members of these growth factors in the embryo. And uh, there's uh, the BMPs, and there's DPP, DPP is the homologue in Drosophila. And there are many mammalian ones. And these uh, will, uh, they are molecules that are secreted by cells, and they form, they diffuse, and then they bind on the surface of cells to receptors. And when they bind to these receptors, which are of two kinds, they get activated and they get what we call phosphorylated and, and then it's active. And then in here comes this SMAD1, which then becomes phosphorylated by the receptor and together with a cofactor goes into the nucleus where it'll find other partners called tr transcription factors 
and all together will bind to target genes and activate the expression of this, these genes. So this is what we call signal transduction, because a signal from the outside is transduced into a change in gene activity. And this partner transcription factor here, that one is also important because in different tissues you have different partners, so you get different results from this simple BMP signal. So the gradient you were seeing was the phosphorylation, this amount of phosphorylation, which varies in the, in the embryo. Now, we do know now that, that um, so, sorry, no. uh, I'll need help, uh, help, I need to advance, help. Are you there? Uh, uh, I, I'll need help. Um, okay, that, that's fine. So the, we now know that BMP inhibitors will shape the, the gradient, and we you know, have isolated in the organizer region, it's, it's fine, uh, a, a gene called Cordon that is going to be very important in, in our talk, and then Richard Harland in Berkeley isolated another gene called Noggin. And now we know that these are antagonists of BMPs that are produced in the ventral side of the embryo. And these antagonists then change the differentiation of cells. So in the ectoderm, for example, this region of the embryo, when you have low BMP, this will differentiate into central nervous system, which is this tissue here. And in the ventral side, where BMP is high, you will then differentiate epidermis. In the mesoderm, at low BMP levels, you will differentiate the notochord. As you go up, you're going to make muscle. Then you're going to make kidney. Then you're going to make lateral plate. And at the highest BMP levels in the mesoderm, you're going to make blood. So this is the stereotypical tissue pattern of the vertebrate. And so the embryo gets one chance to achieve this, and it must get it right every time. And so uh, the one that is the key we're going to study more is this one called cordon. And uh, we know that that one should be very interesting because when overexpressed, it will reproduce this Siamese twin formation. And you will see, you see here it has a secondary gut, a secondary notochord, and a secondary neural tube. So this brings up the interesting thing is, is this, are there three gradients that you get, or is it just one gradient that is patterning all the germ layers? And to see the big differentiation changes, you see here an explant of an embryo that would normally make epidermis. If you just put this cordon BMP antagonist, you see that it makes brain with gray matter and white matter. And in fact, it's not just that the overexpression, but the cordon is, absolutely required for the inducing activity of the Speyman graft. Here you have an albino embryo in which I transplanted a, an organizer uh, which is pigmented. You see how this one goes into the embryo, involutes to make the notochord, and there it will induce the, the twinned embryo. But if you deplete the embryo of cordon, uh, we're using antisense morpholinos, the graft stays just as a patch of epidermis and it induces nothing at all. So therefore, this is required, this, this protein. And this, this uh, antagonist then is made in this dorsal region that has the inductive activity. And uh, it is very abundantly expressed. So uh, this is uh, no RNA, but we've measured the protein, and if it were uniform in the entire embryo, and you see it's not, it would reach concentrations of 33 nanomolar. The BMPs, on the other hand, are in the picomolar range, so there is you know, a vast excess of this protein called cordon. So in principle, to make this m gradient of, of, of information, it would be enough just to have a lot of cordon in this region, or this is the side view. You, know, you see less phosphorylation, more phosphorylation of SMAD1. That means more BMP signaling. So while it would be enough to have one protein, the more that we studied this, we found that there is a whole network consisting of all extracellular proteins that all regulate each other, and the black arrows, so proteins that bind to each other. And so, uh, 
uh, the key one here is going to be cordon, which is this large molecule here that has these modules that bind BMPs, here shown as BMP2 and ADMP, which are two BMPs made on the dorsal part of the embryos. There are others on the ventral side that are also inhibited by cordon. Now, when cordon is bound to the BMPs, they cannot bind to the receptors, and therefore, it's, uh, this is a BMP antagonist. At the same time, they can diffuse through the embryo, and so, therefore, there will be a flux of protein, too. Now, in Drosophila, Yanni Nusslein had isolated a mutation called toloid, that it's a protease, and when this protease was mutated, then you found that, uh, that you had less BMP signaling. And so we reasoned, well, maybe, uh, you know, since this is so important, maybe toloid, uh, which is a protease, digests cordon. And so we could test that biochemically. So it's indicated by these scissors here. And at two very precise sites, it turns out that cordon can be cleaved by toloid. And uh, when that happens, then the BMP is able to bind to its receptors, and therefore it's just a reversible inhibition. And, uh, and uh, so in the ventral side, toloid will release the BMPs into the, and activate signaling. As you see, there are also a great many ventral components on the ventral side of the embryo, one of which is, which is shown here. It's this one called sizzled, which correspond to this protein. And this is cordon, so they're at opposite sides of the embryo, so the, all the embryo participates in this patterning. And this is the blastopore, which eventually is going to become the anus of the animal. And so it turned out that in zebrafish, there, there, there were, and, and in Senapus, there were mutants of, of uh, sizzled that were very similar in the phenotype to those of cordon, so we reasoned, well, maybe this sizzle is functioning in the same cordon pathway. And again, we were then going, going biochemically, we found that sizzle is an inhibitor of toloid in such a way that when you have in the embryo, uh, you, you, the toloid has a choice of either binding to sizzled, which it can bind to but cannot digest, or binding to its substrate cordon, which it then digests and allows BMP signaling. So in this way, you can sort of you know, put together this uh, signaling pathway. Now, a key element in this is this uh, opposite transcriptional control, so that ventral genes are turned on transcriptionally by BMP. These are the blue arrows, but the ones uh, uh, on the dorsal side are activated where BMP is low. And so this is exemplified in this experiment, in which we can take the inject cordon protein into the cavity of an embryo, and with that we decrease BMP signaling, or we can inject BMP4 protein and increase BMP signaling. In one case, you turn on ADMP, and in the other case, you turn on on the ventral side, sizzle when BMP. So the embryo is like a seesaw in which if you decrease BMP by injecting cordon, it'll start making uh, ADMP on the dorsal side, and so that will balance it back. Or if you inject BMP, and then you start making sizzled, and sizzled is going to restore the gradient because sizzled inhibits toloid, and then cordon accumulates, and then you get less BMP. So that's uh, like a feedback uh, mechanism. And so this comes in this way of this uh, uh, transcriptional control. So this system, which has other components that I'm not going to go into uh, today, uh, is self-regulatory uh, because of this transcription and these interactions between activators and inhibitors in the way described by Meinhardt. Now, one th thing that we could never show except indirectly is this hypothetical flux of the red arrows that would go take this em enormous amounts of cordon together with BMPs and rearrangement so that now you can get this long distance communications between the dorsal side of the embryo and the ventral side of the embryo. But recently, more recently, and so uh, uh, Jean-Louis Plunek has been able to improve the uh, staining methods in, in the in, in 
for antibodies in, in Cenobus embryos. So if we inject a dorsoblastomere with a tagged form of BMP2 or of ADMP, he found that it could diffuse at a distance. I think, I hope you can see it uh, here and here you can see. And what was shocking to us, it was this is a little space, which is the extracellular space be that lies between the ectoderm and the endomesoderm. And it turns out that in the frog embryo, this space was known for, for a very, very long time. It's what's called Brachet's cleft in honor of a Brachet, a Belgian embryologist. And it's, what it is is the extracellular matrix that separates the ectoderm from the mesoderm or from the anterior endoderm. And this space extends all the way from the dorsal all the way to the ventral side of the embryo. So this was very interesting because now you could have in this very narrow space this enormous amount of cordon diffusing there in this essentially extracellular matrix that contains many other proteins. And you could have just one gradient patterning the ectoderm and the mesoderm. So the point is that you know, for that you have to see the endogenous proteins. And by then we looked at the long range diffusion of of endogenous cordon using a cordon antibody. And you can see that cordon is expressed on the dorsal side. Uh, and this is the RNA. So this is where cordon is made. But the protein diffuses much more um, a longer distance. And it diffuses through this very narrow space of the, between the ectoderm and the mesoderm. On the side view, you can see that also that, that no cordon is made on the dorsal side only, but it's, it's found in this brache cleft and also a little bit on the ventral sides, meaning that it diffuses all the way from one side to the other, therefore having a long distance morphogen moving from one side to the other. This is specific, the staining, because it disappears when you inhibit cordon. And then we have been able to test our, our system by for example, inhibiting with these toloid morpholinos the protease, and you see there is less BF phosphosmad signaling on the dorsal side. And when you look at cordon, then this is an enzyme, you remember, that digests cordon. There's cordon a little bit in the brachy cleft, but it accumulates much more. You get much more cordon when the protease that destroys is, it is not there. And in particular, if you look at the ventral side, there's much more cordon on the ventral side than on the, than, than on the wild type embryo. But that's because the protease acts as a sink, removing cordon from the ventral side. So the key question then, can this rescale? When you cut an embryo in half, in the half embryo, you know, can, will this rescale the formation of the gradient? For that, we use albino embryos. And uh, the answer is that, indeed, it can rescale. So this is the, the, morpho the gradient of phosphosmad 1. And you see on the, on the ventral side. But if you then look at the half embryo, the dorsal half will rescale this gradient. So, and then on the, the ventral half will keep on signaling to re reach very high levels of signaling uh, of BMP, because this is unrestrained. So then you, there is no dorsal inhibitors. So this reaches levels much higher than it would ever do in the whole embryo. And now if we look at cordon, no, it was there in the brache cleft. And you see that now it, the gradient is reformed, not on the ventral half, but on the dorsal half. It's reformed in this very narrow space. And that, that is very interesting, because it's going to reach very high levels there. And in fact, it might be that this is like an extracellular matrix uh, along which cells are moving. And when they're moving, they might be receiving the positional information as what is the state of this BMP and cordon gradient. So that, I think, tries to exemplify how we can get different levels of understanding at different times in which we understand this. So starting with this Spiemann uh, graft uh, in, in which you, know, you could divide the embryo into two and not know how it might occur, to then this great simplification by Turing and Meinhardt 
that, you know, that, that you might have morphogens and that these morphogens might have pairs of activators and inhibitors and that they must react with themselves to generate pattern. And then finally, to isolate the particular molecules that involved, such as this uh, system of cordon BMP and toloid, which is a network that self-regulates during dorsal, dorsal ventral patterning. And to this finding that a single long range gradient appears to form in the narrow space between the ectoderm and mesoderm. So the concentrations of these substances are going to be very high and that this gradient can rescale after bisection, which will allow us to study in future other aspects of this. And to study this, you need time and funding and good colleagues. And I've been fortunate to have them all. Thank you very much. Thank you.